little bit. Uh, see a tiny bit more of the Sam. This is the Sam. This is the Ben. How are we doing, ladies ah, and gentlemen? We're in the same room for a change. We are physically. First, look, no first. Yeah, like no, no dividing. See line. those physics effects there? Look, I tap this 3D model, and then the clothes deform. Yeah, exactly. Or, or we could I'm actually really just imaginary and just an AI that Ben has written. Oh, that's an idea. Create myself a secret AI project. Sam AI. It'd be pretty good to green teach, screening. To teach, uh, teach programming. That would be pretty good. That would be very scalable when we could cover all the courses everyone wants to do. That's a good idea. Why don't we just AI scale ourselves? Yes. Good idea plan. Practic practical let's, as let's well. That's, what I, like practice, that's yeah. what I like about that one. Oops. There you go. That's me proving it works. Okay, guys, I think we're there. Uh, tell us where you're from. Hello and good morning, afternoon. Oh, perceptual utility. Your, thank you for using your tier two subscriber badge. It's a little bit, your two's a little bit off to the right. It's not from a, you know, actual measurement point of view the middle of the font is in the middle of the image but from a perceptual point of view it's not right in fact lizzie's dad showed us that actually when you do o's they need to be bigger than say eyes because the end of an o is rounded the o's need to go slightly higher than the eye so typography Random. gotta love it yeah so you're here oh wow we've had a subscriber within five seconds it must just be our it must With be sam's hair charisma yeah yeah exactly. it's got to be it's got to be that it's full of bugs at the moment like, there's some like yeah there is some attracted to me Serious bug thing going on here, isn't it? <laughs> so, guys, I just want to put it out there. Our long-term intention is to get some of the world's best uh, Fortnite streamers, a Ninja and the like, to um, be... Was that me? Was that you? That was, uh, you. That was me. Um, to uh, silent, raid yeah. our stream. So that's what we want to do when it comes to Unreal and Blueprint longer term. We want to show the world how to do really simple stuff in Unreal using Blueprint. And the proposition would be, hey, if you've been watching a Fortnite stream, why, hey, why, hey, Ninja, why not bring your guys in and... Uh, Dive in on our stream and we'll start to show you some of the very basics of <coughs> a game like that. But That's for today... Hope. Today we will be going through some blueprint, won't we? Yep. So, so we we're have... looking for a bit of direction in terms of which way you'd like us to go. We could start with really bare bones project, uh, completely no magic and show you what you can do from scratch. Or we could go with something a little bit more jazzy, some of the uh, built-in kits that Unreal's got. In fact, let me show you some of the options that we've got in terms of built-in kits. So I'm going to launch up Unreal. Um, so if you've never ha done any Unreal before, this is the stream for you. If you've only done C Sharp before, or if you've not even programmed before, we're going to take you through some kind of basic concepts of how easy it can be to just uh, do anything very, very simple in, in Unreal. It's basically a fully fledged programming language and very easy for folks who've never done any programming before. So, uh, And just to remember, of course, that this is the very engine that Fortnite's written in. Absolutely. And it's just to hit mobile as well, which is pretty amazing. So on iOS, I've been playing it on iOS. So. Yeah, exactly. And you, yeah, and you can do that kind of game, multi-platform, console, to all the way to phones on Unreal. It's very flexible, powerful. Um, engine. It is the most powerful engine we teach, of course. Remember that uh, Unity is better than Godot. Ooh, Godot uh, sorry, Unreal is better than Unity and that Godot is better than Unreal. Yeah. It's like rock, paper, scissors. Um, so it is the most powerful thing we teach. It's also the hardest thing we teach. Uh, you kind of get what you pay for. Uh, by the way, there's a quick poll up for two minutes saying whether in general you'd rather we start. So this type of thing, Sam, on here. Yeah, so, so whether we start basic code. Sorry, let me go to the blueprint one. Basic code. So blank, or, blank world, you get the satisfaction of building it from the ground. Or, or we could use some of these and build some functionality on top of them. So, so for example, uh, some of the options might be a, a advanced vehicle physics, which is quite fun to play around with, just like seeing how cool some of the physics looks. We could do a third person uh, guy follow, follow through camera kind of thing. Uh, so these are rolling ball, which is a little bit simpler, flying first person shooter type stuff. So on the poll, that is start with pretty magic boxes. So this is our choice initially. It's whether you want the satisfaction of going from complete bare bones, but it will look rubbish for approximately six months worth of strip. Yep. And that'd be awesome. And then we'll get in and get some blueprint done, making games without code. More ninja max. Unreal is also a very big boy, very well fed. Could struggle getting upstairs sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and bloated. Yeah. A bloated yeah. game engine is Unreal. Yeah. Yeah. But amazing. It's in terms of, I think you need a good machine to develop with Unreal, but not necessarily a good machine to run Unreal games. I think that's fair to say. So the editor itself is rather resource consuming. So I've had a couple of two or three editor instances open and using almost all of my 32 gigs of RAM. So 
depends on your project, but it can yeah. get quite heavy. And compilation time, right? If you're used to rapid, rapidly compiling, seeing the effect and going around. Just well, with Blueprint, it's fine. Yeah, with Blueprint, it's fine. Yeah. Another good reason to use Blueprint. Definitely. And just translate the slow bits of code. So, guys, this is not just for you who want to shy away from C++ programming. This is for anybody who wants to rapidly prototype in Unreal. You really want to think about writing good quality Blueprint yep. because it is coding. Um, still encapsulating, refactoring, naming properly, yeah, connecting properly. It's not an properly. excuse to do crap code, is no, it? No, it's absolutely not. It's a way of rapidly getting your results out there. And if you ever find that you need to speed something up or do something that the uh, hit an API that Blueprint doesn't touch, there's got to be plenty of APIs Blueprint doesn't expose, right? There are, absolutely. Yeah. If you're going really deep into some of the, the more obscure functionality of the engine, especially around multiplayer, you'll, you'll quickly run into stuff yeah. that doesn't exist. So, and at that point, you know, what you really ought to do is go and, and make a, an API that makes sense to your game in C++, expose it to Blueprint and carry on. You know, you can carry on prototyping. There's no reason that you have to give up on Blueprint at that point. No. Awesome. Why don't, so they, it's, it's the vote is, well, there's basically no numbers. So we can't really tell from that. But what we have is no particular landslide in either direction. So how about, think? how about flying? We haven't done anything with flying. Should yeah, we? this is a top-down flyer. Oh no, this one's not the top down. There's also a top down flyer. So we've got this top. Oh, well, there we go. Twin stick. There you go. So there's a twin stick one. Or a flying, flying. Or we a could flying, do a flying, flying. flying. I've never to used try and this add... one before. Me neither. But we could... why don't we? Let's try it. Yeah. Why don't we go a little bit un Where uncertain? Should we... Where should we save this stuff? You can stick it. You probably better stick it in repos, um, and then we better make a new folder called uh... Getting Unreal. Yeah, we could. That would be fine. And then we will start to commit this. If we carry on with this project through future streams, then at least we can start putting it on GitHub. Well, and we, can, we can commit it after this stream, can't we? Yeah, exactly. If needs be. So, okay, so what should our game be about? Should we have some name suggestions? Can anyone suggest some names for a game? We could actually just work off the, the name and try and make a game that fits the name. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be fun. That'd so be what, is, fun. what is that little thumbnail of this blue... Like, I don't know, Cyan Wasp would be a one name for the game, for example. It kind of looks like a... <laughs> Let's go around and sting people. Wasp, yeah, sting people. What are we going to call it? We're just going to play with Blueprint and Unreal and flying and see if we can answer, say, Twitch Dog's question, which is, is the scope for expanding with your own Blueprint designs? Uh, uh, absolutely. It's a fully... You can do... There are full games out there. Cube Cube 1 is one example. Q-U-B-E. Uh, with Dan DeRosha, a friend of mine. Uh, he uh, he made Cube straight out of university in Blueprint, commercial game, successful game, no code at all. You, you don't need to touch C++ at all with that. Dalek Flight Simulator. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I like that one. Yep, Dalek. Dalek Flight Simulator. Let's go with that, Dan Bio. Thank you very yeah, much for I that. I think that's good. Dalek Flight. And thank you for Graham Great, Great Llama. Great Llama for subscribing with Twitch Prime. That is awesome. And uh, thank you to Damien for using the new cheer remote. We've now got a new cheer uh, Various different sizes that it'll make this there. maximum quality. Let's see, starter content. Do we want starter content? Um, Maybe. Bindi, Maybe we I want some starter content. Don't know if Snagit Education is any different to answer your question. <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, check their feature list. It's probably just cheaper. I'll do the um, best I can. Yeah. Cool. Dalek Flight Simulator. I like that name. Thank you very much for that name. That is awesome. Hello, uh, Black Peepow? 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 Something like that. Captain Sam, yeah, there's another one. Uh, awesome. That's what I was saying, I do the best I can. But it's not Captain Sam, right? It's Uncle Sam. Shadow Healer says he's crap with coding, that's why I invented control, uh, copy and paste, basically. Oh, no, no, don't do that. That's called cargo cult programming. <laughs> cargo cult programming. Um, which I think derives from the idea that uh, uh, I think it's folks who weren't in contact with the first world would have cargo shipments dropped in by planes so they would build effigies that looked like the planes to try and bring more cargo okay. so, it's the, so the idea is that you don't really understand the mechanism but you try and kind of invoke the oh, okay invoke the, invoke the gods with your yeah exactly so that's why it's cargo cult programming because you don't understand how it works but you know this snippet of code works sometimes so you yeah. repeat the the uh, the shape of the code but not actually understanding of it yes. okay so how does this work Okay, well, okay. What controls you got? WSAD. So I've got WSAD. It looks like W pitches down, A pitches up. You can do this for yourself, by the way, guys. Flight you just level. use the Epic Games launcher, which is of course the thing you use to launch Fortnite. So if it you've is. Got that. If you've got Fortnite, you've got the Epic Games launcher. All you've got to do is download the engine. You can start downloading the engine right now. 
as, as long as by the doesn't... end of the stream you could give it all this stuff that you've learned in the stream a go which is great so what we're doing so far you literally just download the latest version of unreal engine open up the flight simulator and you are doing this You're... yeah so we have, we've not written a line of code by the way this is interesting when i turn around it pitches down I'm just wondering whether it pitches down just over time. No, when I turn it, definitely pitches down. And have a quick feel of it. Just yeah, I do. Before we hit the ground. As a real pilot, and just tell you whether it, oops, it feels even remotely useful or real. What's the simulation model here? So we've got, so with a real aircraft, you've got, when you yaw, which is what this thing seems to be doing with A and D, when we yaw left, we're getting a little bit of left roll, which you actually expect because as you yaw the aircraft left, the right-hand wing is going faster than the left-hand wing. So the secondary effect of a sharp yaw like that is a tiny bit of roll. So they've got that in, which is cool. Mm. Um, the pitching up and down, there aren't so many secondary effects to pitching. So that's not very exciting. Uh, and rolling, of course, has a secondary effect of yaw. So if you roll to one side, the aircraft side slips a little bit. And that does appear to be doing a bit of that as well. So it doesn't feel even remotely aircrafty, though, for no, some reason. No, but it is a Dalek, so that's okay. Um, and that is because its velocity, it's not trading gravitational potential for kinetic energy. This is what feels weird about this. So that could be the first thing we could consider looking at um, in Blueprint, is this guy, as he mm. dives, is not picking up speed. He's just got a constant forward motion velocity, which is which is kind of rubbish. Yeah. Uh, it's is fine as a game. speed it up? Like, can you hit space bar or something? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Space bar's doing it. Space bar's making them So faster. space bar's like afterburners or something off the world. It won't actually matter if we go miles off the world, by the way. It looks like... Um, so the first thing, if we wanted to make this a realistic flight simulator, which is not necessarily our mandate, Rick would be saying, bugger that, let's think about what's interesting and fun. But it would be the first thing that strikes me as a pilot is that as I dive, I'm not trading my gravitational for Well, that would be fun energy. because like, I think a dive would, you know, being able to dive and have a, have a fast dive would be really cool. Yeah. So maybe we make that as a first, a first challenge. Can we, can we somehow make the thing pick up speed? Um, yep. Now, you need to think about this. It's not just the lower you are, the faster you are because of air resistance. But we could say there's no air resistance at first. Yeah. So if this was in space, then when you were low, you'd be fast. And when you're high, you'd be slow. And there would be no. And if you changed by just rocket thrusters that only ever act at 90 degrees to your motion, then it would literally be whenever you're high, you're slow. And whenever you're low, you're fast. You're basically in orbit dynamics. Yeah. So that would be one hack. In, in air, it's totally different because in air, you're constantly throwing energy away to the air. So it's a different dynamic. But... Uh, we could go with that to start with. You're low, you're fast, you're high, you're slow. Um, it would be weird. It will feel really weird and unnatural. Yeah, but it would probably. be like over an evacuated city. Um, should we try and find its motion controls in Blue? Let's, let's start off by having a look, a little bit of a uh, look around the code base. So uh, this has actually gone and blocked my view of the, of the lovely things that our subscribers are saying. So I'm going to make our editor window just a little bit smaller. So Red Special is saying, why don't we use the migrating feature instead of adding starter content from the start? Any particular reason? No. Not really. No, I was just thinking, you know, that if we wanted to pull in some pretties, we'll have it there at our the fingertips. We can definitely migrate some stuff in later. It's just easy for you guys to follow. We're yeah. just playing with Blueprint at this stage. Oops, he's, Sam's found the button that makes my desk go down. Just easy for you guys to follow. Why not just do it this way? It doesn't matter, really. We're just going to get into some Blueprint. So thanks for asking, though. High cringe factor. Uh, Perceptual lucidity, I'm not sure what's cringe. That's the Dalek Flight Simulator, probably. Thank you for being here again. You guys are amazing. Same with Absolutely. Dan Bio, Mole Ninja Max, all of you guys who never leave. Hey, Heartbeast is here. Benjamin, welcome. Thank you very much for being awesome. here. Awesome. Good to see you. Um, Heartbeast and I are going to be, uh, we're going to be hosting each other a little bit. Uh, if you're interested in Godot and you're interested in following um, Benjamin Anderson's interesting journey as an indie developer, go see his channel, You Heart Beast. I think you can just click through You Heart Beast. I'm having a bit of a second oh. idea in terms of what we should implement first. Okay, yep. Uh, roll of Thunder, which I think is something falling over upstairs. <laughs> but um, it, so a few people are yelling exterminate in the chat, and I'm wondering whether we should have an exterminate feature, seeing as it is the flight, Dalek flight simulator. Maybe we can have a look at how to... Uh, instead of speeding up when we hit the space bar, we shoot out a laser beam and destroy these blocks around us. Yep, Something exactly. Like Sh shooting some stuff would be fun. And, and yelling exterminate while that happens. Perceptual lucidity <laughs> saying, should, it, it is the way that this is handling because of the fact we're using keys to control it. I can confidently say, no, that's not what I'm picking up. I'm picking up the fact that when we dive, regardless of how we deflect the control surfaces with the keys, we ought to be picking up speed. But Let's I don't see what happens care about that particularly. Dive Let's bomb. see what happens. Oh, it just bounces. So just straight <laughs> rigid body collisions of a very tough ship. Yep. Yeah, I think I think if you can think how to do it quickly and easily in Blueprint, some lasers that fire off and then maybe extend, yeah. fire off a particle effect on impact. 
we can get we can see how far we head get to, head towards we that. can work towards so first a... of all just destroying blocks by by heading towards them and hitting space yeah and then we can yeah have a look so that's good because i think that way we don't have to dig in too much to what their code is doing which might be more advanced than this stream yeah uh but we can yeah, just strap on some lasers strap, some, a, yeah. strap on a laser yeah. that's what i'm talking laser, about laser strap on.com oh dear that's what we need don't google that yeah. Right, so um, the first things first is we need to have a look at how the input is being bound. So at the moment that happens, uh, well, in Unreal this always happens if you go to Settings and Project Settings, we have input being bound in somewhere in here. Let me just go scroll down. It's not Maps and Modes. That's where I'm usually going. I think it's Engine Input. So under the Engine Heading, we've got Input. And then you've got the Bindings section. And I think these are all Axis Bindings. So axis being when you've got a continuous value from zero to one which means if we probably plugged in a controller then we'd be able yeah, to does have more it continuous do mapping the same type of easing as in unity so in unity you've got in your input manager you've got the concept of when you're using the keyboard it pretends you're using a um a gamepad so what it does is you have gravity sensor and sensitivity so when you push a key it takes the value of that axis from zero to one over a certain period of time quite fast but as if I don't think it does. I think I it think is it just that. directly from zero to one. Okay, because that's quite an interesting feature in Unity. It makes a game playing a game that can be both played on a gamepad and a keyboard very quick because you have sensitivity and then gravity. So, because on because of course on a real control stick, you, you when you push it forward, there's a finite amount of time between between the value the output of the stick being zero and being plus one, uh, and it yeah. goes up at a certain rate. It may not be linear, but what Unity does is approximate the key press to a linear ramp. Yeah, so goes, I reckon Unreal either probably leaves that to you yeah. to handle later down the line. Probably. I just wondered if it was in the input settings here. But not not in here that I can see. Um, although, who knows, maybe further down here. Uh, console keys. No, that's going to be something else, isn't it? We're purposefully so, touching areas of Unreal see. we don't touch very much, by the way, guys, to, just to stress ourselves. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, my blueprint. I mean, most of our courses are all C++ courses, in actual fact. Absolutely. So if, you are, if you're saying, oh, blueprint's all fine, but I'd like to learn more C++, well, we've got plenty of courses for that. So this is more of an introduction for you folks. Okay, so we've got a few different axes. Uh, we've got a move up axis. We've got a move right axis. And just like any anything like in Unity as well, you don't have a move left axis as well. That's just the negative of the move right axis. And we've got thrust. So you can see, okay, here's how we would break. It's obviously with the negative of thrust. And there's a few ways of doing that. There's a left control, right control is a breaking action by the looks of it. Uh, triggers on the motion controller. Uh, pressing the right thumbstick up is also breaking. Okay, so that's useful. What we want to do then is figure out maybe a key that isn't being used and create a new action. Maybe left shift to fire or... Could do left shift, couldn't we? Let, I it's think left, a bit rubbish. left shift's already there, but we don't need it to be there because there's already left control. Oh, mm, where's so, spacebar? Oh, we could just remove spacebar because we've got left shift and control. Spacebar's thrusting, isn't it? But we've got left shift that we can use for thrust as well. It's yeah, let's do that. Bound. Space would be the most natural thing to fire. So let's remove space from our thrust axis and bind it to an action mapping which is more of a yes no binary on off yeah, yeah key, exactly key, key down key up usually so we'll call this action fire like so and what we're going to do is we're going to just do a really really noddy simple thing of finding the place the the thing that represents that spaceship in the world the blueprint that represents that spaceship and just be able to print out something in the log when we hit fire. Yeah. So just bear in mind with actions that on most platforms, Xbox, PS4, uh, and the sort of game controller you'd use on a PC, which is like an Xbox is an Xbox controller, that most of the buttons these days are actually analog. So something is thresholding somewhere. Something is saying you've got to press it a certain amount of hardness. Not on a PC keyboard. True. But so True. if you're going to make something completely intercompatible between a PC and a, and a console button, just to where there's some thresholding going on somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And when you pull the trigger and use an action for for a trigger pull, there will actually be 
it will do that thresholding automatically for you. So it will feel quite natural because between games, they're probably doing exactly the same threshold. Yeah. I reckon even the hardware probably has that threshold built in. Yeah, and Brian's talking about the possibility of using mouse input. That is a possibility as well, that we move the mouse around to control We them. could do to fire the laser in different directions, but let's not get yeah. ahead of ourselves. We can, we can add that on top. So what we could do is we could bind the action to the mouse button very easily, as well as the space bar, and we can take the mouse location on the screen to try and aim our ray through a particular pixel on the screen if yeah. we want to. So that's definitely a good and idea. Brian. When flying an aircraft, I always wish for the ability to point the gun somewhere apart from where the fuselage is pointing. It's really irritating having to maneuver an aircraft because you want to shoot something off axis and not many aircraft will let you do that. So our aircraft ought to allow off axis shooting. Definitely. Apart from it has a problem, of course. What's the problem, guys, with shooting a big powerful weapon off axis on, a, on an aircraft in the chat? What would the problem be? I'm doing that. That could make some really fun game mechanics. It could make some awesome game mechanics. In fact, <laughs> kind yes, of it, like that game we made. Actually. What was that game we made? Where it was all about recoil. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I can't remember what we called that was it. What, that's what we did, that for, the the jam, jam, for the game jam. The first yeah. Ludum Jair. We yeah, just yeah. called it recoil, didn't we? Something like that. Yeah. And the theme was the more the worse or something. The more there is the worse. The, uh, worse the more it, you have, the worse it gets or something like that. Yeah. So and we then, decided that that was guns. And yeah. so we kept adding guns to the spaceship. But and... when you fire the ship, it goes backwards. And it's crazy. We ought to bring that yeah. up again. We will yeah. do a stream at some point about we'll that. We'll we dust off that, that project. Yeah. Yeah, not right now, but no, we'll, no, no. we'll do a stream that dusts off that Because that's Unity anyway, so let's keep it's on track Unity, the topic. Yeah. So I'm just uh, expanding out these folders here in terms of what we've got in the content. And we've got a few things. Uh, I'm just trying to expand it out to see where it would be a likely place if you were doing this. Um, the starter content, obviously, this is what we've included at the beginning. It's not what, it's not related to the gameplay of this particular thing. Geometry and meshes isn't going to have any uh, functionality in it. So we're looking basically for the blueprints folder. And in here, we've got a couple of things. The game mode, which talks about things related to how this game is set up. For example, which pawn should be launched into the scene first. A pawn is Unreal's idea of a controllable actor in the scene and an actor is a unit of um, gameplay essentially so you have in this world outliner to the right here we've got a list of actors in our scene and we can see that there's a, a bunch of cubes uh, this one's the ground cube we've got uh, these other template cubes are all actors in the scene everything that sh it shows in the world outliner is an actor and when we go ahead and hit play Let's just have a look at what's happened in the world outliner. We should now find somewhere in here a pawn. There's a few in yellow here, which I think is telling me that they've been spawned at runtime. Uh, we've got a camera actor. We've got the game mode, which is this, this blueprint we're seeing down here in the content browser. And we have got uh, player state, player controller. And somewhere here we should have the pawn. Where is the pawn? Flying pawn, okay, that's not in yellow, but it has been spawned at runtime. So this is the thing that I think I want to put our laser onto. So let's go ahead and open up that blueprint and see what it looks like. So I'll fire up this flying pawn and uh, see what editors we get. So we get a brand spanking new editor. This is the kind of depth that you've got in Unreal, whereas in Unity you would always stay in this kind of view, wouldn't you, when you're editing anything putting together game objects. You always mo mainly have the same editor. Unreal has like a gazillion editors. Um, so this is the this I is left the him alone for two board. seconds and look what he's done to the screen. Yeah, well, I haven't made this. So this is it's what's awesome. come in with us. Um, and you can see they've annotated all the sections for uh, if an HMD is enabled. So this is if you are doing it in VR, I think. So yep. even, it's even VR enabled. Head mounted display. Yeah, exactly. HMD, head mounted display. Uh, we've got applying forward speed and steering rotation. Set forward speed using thrust input. So we could look into this if we wanted to. It could be a hedgehog of mass destruction. A hedgehog of mass destruction. HMD is more likely, isn't it? Yeah, hedgehog of mass destruction. I think so. Definitely. Sorry. Squirrel. Ben adding lots of value here. Some I do, I do. Squirrel, that's that's my purpose. Yep. Okay. So and so let's let's take a look at break down this editor because it's a bit of a eyeful really. Uh, here in the main section we have got the what's called the event graph. This is where you'll see the main um, programming like functions of Blueprint, where we've got a bunch of nodes 
and they are wired up to pass their execution flow and their data between each other. So what this is saying is when you get the event tick, then using the white arrow, we follow it's kind of a then, it's the uh, next step. Go and do an actor local offset. What data should I use for that? Then you look at the other pins that are not white. And so example, make, it's gonna make this vector out of multiplying the delta seconds by the current forward speed. So that's how you read Blueprint. It's very Can intuitive once you get one, into it. One is it, little nibble larger. Is it maybe one nibble to... to just just to be really clear, if their stream is lower res, maybe oh, just yeah. one smaller if it's possible. Bad, that's it, and okay. then maybe make the details panel less wide. Yep, we can make the details panel less wide. We could even move the details panel over here. It's all totally reconfigurable. There you go. Awesome. So is that visible? Just that's about? That's fine. The font can police can go now. away. Yeah. What's that? The font police have gone. The font police. Yesterday I was being a font policeman. It's like, make your font bigger. It was oh, like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that's how we read Blueprint. It is awesome. very much like the lines of code in your scripts. Uh, and then what you can do is a blueprint is like a class in, in other programming languages. So this it tells you how to create an instance. It's like the, uh, the factory that produces widgets. Uh, and then when you have something in the scene, it is an instance. It is that widget that's been produced by the factory. And the white lines on here are execution flow. Yes. So basically method calls. Not necessarily method calls. No, is there something else it could be? Well, it's just line after line. So the, so the, just order, the, order, of, the, the order, order of, of your lines. code. Exactly. And then the other lines, the color of them is going to depend on the type of the object that is moving yep. around. So your green, yep. I think, is floats in this I case. Think floats. I think yellow might be vectors. Yeah, and you can get rich types as well You've going got, around. You've uh, got purple is rotations. And so on. So just to get so your so eye in, guys. Yep. And yes, you can refactor. Yes, you can uh, encapsulate. Yes, yeah, you and can. the refactor tools are really good because you could just go ahead and grab all of this and say, well, this is oh, ooh, all, all but one. All but one. Uh, and you can right click on it and go, let's collapse this to a function. Boom. Boom, like that. And then I can rename the function that was doing something like uh, apply rotation and and speed. Do I, how do I do this? Spaces, I think, are fine. There you go. Yeah, so and we probably encourage speed. spaces where you can use them. If you're in an environment like this, probably use spaces. Yeah, I mean, it's more readable, if anything. Yeah. But it's definitely, uh, some, in some places, they aren't using it. So. And you can encapsulate, including your own custom inputs and outputs and all the rest of it. You could have encapsulated just a, a section of that yeah. and it would have done that. I mean, you can see you. it's done, it's automatically given us a custom input in here. So this is for folks who, who've done other programming languages before. If you've never seen any of this before, then... Obviously, this is probably going a little bit over your head, but we will dive onwards. So you've also got in this left pane the My Blueprint tab, uh, which tells you about your instance variables. So you've got things like the acceleration and turn speed are all variables on this class, that will, or rather they're, yeah, declarations of variables that will be variables on the instances. Or state, another word for that is state yep. of the class. So if we click on the flying pawn in the world outliner, you can, is that what airline pilots watch? <laughs> um, We've had terrible trouble with our automatic captions of the Unreal course with our pawns, unfortunately. People. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So we can see if we go to the world outliner and click on the pawn in there, this is an instance, not the class of the pawn. So what you can do here is look at the actual values that this is going to have. This is very much like the inspector that you have in Unity. Uh, you can see that we've got some default values in here so for the acceleration, turn speed, max speed, min speed, etc., And a bunch of other stuff that comes in automatically from, from the actor. Okie doke. And so what, and finally, there is a component system in Unreal as well. You've got all these actors in your scene. The actors can be childed to each other, etc. But another level of complexity is that you can have components on each actor. So we've got here a bunch of components being attached to this pawn, which give it its behavior. And one of them is the plane mesh. So here in the central pane, I can change over tabs to the viewport where I can see a preview of this individual actor without having to put it in any scene, unlike Unity. So I can just see this pawn by itself. And you can see there is a mesh attached to the mesh. There is a spring arm and then attached to the spring arm is the camera. And this basically is the setup that we're seeing ourselves watching the plane 
the Dalek fly through the air. Okay, so we wanted to hook up a fire event. How would we do that? What would be the most logical place to go to try and hook up an event? What do you reckon? So I'm going to go to the event graph. This is where we handle, funnily enough, events. So we're going to put in a new event and we can put in a new event for the input type we've just created. And this is an advantage of Blueprint actually because in C++ you have to string bind these things. There you go. Um, whereas in Blueprint, that's kind of automatic. So if we right click uh, on in our Blueprint and look for the fire event, you can see that it is automatically found that fire event from the configuration that we were setting up previously. In C++, you'd have to string reference that. And then we've got two, uh, what would you call these? Two exit pins from this fire event, pressed and released which tells us where, which type of event this is. Is this when the fire button goes down? Is it when the fire button comes up? Which one do you think we want to use? I reckon we probably want to use the, the button down. To, yeah, on button down. On it button down. depends. We need to decide whether we've got a, what's the firing paradigm? Is it put, when the button is held, it continuously fires? It'd be typical for a game like this. Yeah, that if, might be a little bit more complicated. So I think we'll just do a single action when you, when you press it, and then we can talk about rate limiting it differently. Yep, that's fine. So what we're going to do here is pressed and we can pull off a pin from that which is going to say that when pressed do this so what we're going to do we want to print out a message maybe so there is a node called print this is very much like using autocomplete in visual studio except it's it's very sensitive to your context which can be very useful if you've pulled off a pin of a particular type it will be looking for things that match with that particular type quite handy uh, so it's very useful for discovering bits of the API you didn't know about in Unreal. And I use it very much when I don't know what the API is going to be in C++. I try and write it in Blueprint first. It can be much more discoverable. And then very often there are exactly the same methods over in C++. So we're going to look for the, the print string, I think, is the one we want. And this node is a development-only node because it will switch off when it's actually in-game. And we can tell it what message we want to print. So this is very, very tiny, I'm aware. So let's uh, zoom in a bit so you can see what's going on. OK, so we're going to print string, not hello, but fire. Exclamation point. So we can save and compile. I think the compile is not strictly necessary. And then we can go ahead and play the game and have a look. So if I hit space now, hmm. That isn't working, but I'm hearing an echo of myself. That's very off-putting, isn't it? Slightly, yeah. So I'm not <laughs> getting anything through at the moment, which is interesting. So I wonder whether that should work. Let's drop down and see. So it's got a, f a couple of options that were hidden here, kind of had default values, which you can expand out. We've got a print to screen, a print to log. Both of those are happening, and it tells you a duration for how long it's going to happen for. And if we want to look at the log, we can go over to our, yes. back to our main tab here. Oh, sorry, correction. It's got to be exterminate rather than fire, Sam, according to Keith. You are absolutely I'm right. I'm going to get some water, I'm by the way. I'm going to go and change that right now. Bug in the code. Vital. Oh, I've got an idea for our break in about 10 minutes. Our stretch break. Is it going to be a green idea? Big green idea. Should I get the big green thing out and point the camera out the window in 10 minutes for our stretch yes, break? Yes, I think we should do that. We should do that. Okay. Yep. A little bit of a... A squirrel for Ben. Right, so uh, what's going wrong? Let's have a look at our output log. If we go to the main tab, we've got a dialog down here in a separate tab called the output log. And I wanted to see whether it printed anything out. I'm afraid it probably didn't. <laughs> have I got a typo anywhere else? Did anyone else notice what the bug is before I go debugging this whole thing? So we've hooked up fire. Aha, I think what's happened, if I go over to settings, project settings, I don't think I ever hooked up the space bar to that fire action. So let's go into the engine uh, settings again, into the input, uh, expand out fire. Yeah, sure enough, I didn't bind the space bar. So if we expand out fire, you can see that you can add multiple action mappings. We're only going to need one. And we're going to want it to be mapped to the spacebar. How do I go ahead and delete one of these? Oh, okay, just 
expand closing the expansion every time I went to delete one of the items from the mapping. Okay, so the spacebar is now hooked up. That's why it wasn't working. Let's see whether exterminate will happen. If I go ahead and hit play, hit space. There we go, exterminate, exterminate. So that's working. We've got very, very basic, some very, very basic blueprint knowledge there, able to print something out when we hit a key, but that's quite cool. And you've got a little bit of a taste for how simple blueprint can be. I wonder whether, did you guys find that simple? Does it look simple compared with coding? Do you prefer coding? What do you think? Yes, perceptual lucidity. I did say that I use Blueprint to help me locate things that I would do in C++ because often the um, autocomplete for Visual Studio is not quite as good. It's quite a lot slower for a start and um, Blueprint, you can just iterate much quicker. So you can go ahead and change something very, very, very rapidly uh, because there's no compile time. Actually, you, you know, you saw how quick it was to compile. Um, C Sharp, if you're used to C Sharp, it probably doesn't compile very, very slow, uh, doesn't compile slowly, so you probably haven't noticed it, but C++ can take at least 10 seconds when you've made a very small change, up to 30 or 40 seconds when you made larger changes to header files and things. So Blueprint, especially in Unreal, can be a massive time saver. Uh, let's see what you guys are saying in the chat in response to me. And a bit like using VAR, by the time you've gone to Blueprint, um, used it to discover the API, and then got some functionality slightly working, a bit like going var sum variable equals something, why don't you just leave it at that for now? And it's, it's, it's a thought to just not even bother. Don't have to go over to C++, mess around writing the code, compile it. And they've even got visual diffing on Blueprint, right? That's something they that... do, they do. You don't have visual merging, so that can be a bit problematic if you, you'll need to make sure other people aren't working on the Blueprint while you're working on the Blueprint. So there is a bit of a version control issue. Yeah, when we were trying to, Sam and I have had conversations about why would you code when you can do visual scripting. And version control is one, it's still not yep. as good. No. Um, it's not as neat as something I just said in the chat. And that, that particular blueprint you've got right there is. But if you're a real yeah. visual person and you really want it to look beautiful. But this, this is one line would be, well, it, actually we, this would be a, quite a few lines of C++ because you have to do the binding. But even that, that's pretty neatly laid out, is still messy. It is. And there's too much decision. We have enough arguments about where we stick our dangly bracket things yep. in coding. Now we've got, oh, should we cross the stream? Shouldn't we cross the stream? Should this be in front of that? So visually it's messy. Um, it's not as compact. I don't think you can get as much no. functionality on, on a screen as you can. No, this would be like, code. A, like two or three lines of so it's code. Quite so you'd have, you'd, you'd have a, your if statement is very, very compact. Um, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Too much compactness leads to too much. Um, it depends. I think, I think you can't read Blueprint as quickly. Yeah, um, probably So true. there's a lot of... There I, are definitely downsides to Blueprint, but I think... When it comes to programming in Unreal, if you're programming in Unreal, then the massive upshot is, the massive upside rather, is that you don't have to spend as long waiting for it to compile. So I would prefer if they had a scripting language that was actually textual mm -hmm. and they had all the autocomplete features for that scripting language. That would be, I'd, that would be my favorite. Or I would have no problems at all. With it. I would love to see something that generates blueprint to a consistent styling rule set from the code you're writing. Two way. Well, we've got one way. Blueprint to C++. By the way, blueprint will generate unreadable C++. Yep. Like minifying a, an HTML page or something. Just something that is yep. useful for the computer, useless to us. Yep. But it'd be great if we could have something that we write code. It writes blueprint to a style. We write blueprint. It writes code to a style. Which, by the way, means that you can create fairly high performance blueprint because it can just compile down to C++. We don't, you don't have all the control that you'd have in C++, but you certainly, it, it's not got a runtime overhead. So if you were to write exactly the same code in C++, it's no different really in, for the, once it's compiled. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. So there's no performance benefit these days of using C++ over blueprint potentially. So you really need to look at it as an option visual scripting. I still think, and I have no grounding for this, I still think that if VR takes off, that coding minority report style in VR, there's some serious advantages to being able to not only lay out the code in three dimensions, but use that to somehow visualize yep. what's going on data and execution flow wise. I think yep. that you may be able to create code in such a way that you performance profile very naturally as you go, because you see data pipes, you see the size of them, you see the rate of execution flow. 
could be amazing. I don't know how to do it. Um, hopefully, unreal people will do it. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Cool. We want to have a, a little catch up on the chat while I uh, yeah, let's take them through the next step. So what we want to do next is not just print exterminate. Uh, we'd actually like to do something like try and maybe hit these blocks and destroy them. So let's see. We can do this with a ray cast, which is basically shooting a, a, a visible light ray through the scene in a certain direction and then seeing what we hit. And we can just start off by doing that, seeing what we hit, what comes back, and see if there's anything we can do there. That's gonna, a good place to start. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this after we have hit printed the string exterminate. So I'm going to pull a node off the end of this and I am going to see if there's anything to do with ray casting, tracing, words like that. So let's see, ray cast, navigation ray cast, not quite it. But you notice that it's actually brought up a whole lot of stuff that didn't have the word ray cast in it because it has it's got, it must have some keywords associated with these things to help you find them. So that's yeah. really handy. Well, so line traces are basically ray casting. If you did this in Visual Studio, those would not come up. No, that's would... useful. Where is, it, where is it getting that from? There's, I think there's some probably in the documentation or they've tagged it with some keywords. The discoverability keywords. is a big The discoverability here is really good. I mean, there's no reason that couldn't happen in code no, if you had isn't. a custom editor no. or some useful annotation features. No, and we, we were talking, we would like IDEs to, to help you discover stuff by functionality as well, which is effectively mm. what this is doing. You, the lingo you know here is, is Raycast, but in Unreal it's called line tracing. Exactly. So this has just helped us a lot yep. um, to say what the func what we're trying to do. Yeah, so you don't even need to crack, up any, uh, crack open any <laughs> documentation. If you, if you understand the basics of Blueprint, you can just go around going, well, I know in another engine it would be called Raycasting or something, and, and find useful functions. Okay, so enough uh, meta talk. Let's have a go at this. So there's a couple of options here. They're a little bit cryptic. Uh, the line trace by channel, line trace by profile. Um, which one should we go for? There, there's, some, there's some differences here in terms of who chooses how to respond to your trace. Uh, I'm going to go for a line trace by channel and then we'll see what options we've got. So uh, we have got a start and an end. So this is going to tell us basically where we start tracing from and the end point of the trace. And then it's going to go linearly between. So let me just point this out. We've got uh, a start, an end, and then it's going to go from the start to the end and see if it hit anything along the way. And then it's going to return the, on the right here this out hit, which is a structure telling us more information about what we've hit along the way. And it, I think it just returns the first thing there. Go on, go for it. In C++ code, that out here is an out parameter. Yes, Ben does not like out parameters. But in C++, they are a bit of a necessary evil, I guess. They're not so evil. It's just it's just not how you expect to read a function. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem the is that in C++, you can't have multiple return values, right? Yeah. You could have a struct you returned, could have a struct. That and that might be option. helpful. But this is, but this looks much more natural, right? Because we're going into this line. So, so just to be clear, use it not advanced programmers. An out parameter is where you, you, you prepare a structure that is only being passed in as a parameter for the purposes of putting data into that thing you pass in. So you have a variable there, you, you, you create it, you call a function with this variable in the parameter list, yep. and then it writes back to that variable. It's kind of not what you're expecting. You're expecting a parameter to tell you how a function works. And this do hides that, actually, completely. Totally, because it's got two, two out... Out variables, yeah. basically. And we haven't had to prepare that out parameter. You no. would in C++ had no, to have said nicer. raycast hit hit yep. equals whatever. And I mean, this is this is because C++ is a like 60-year-old language or something, right? It's it's very, it's it's quite decrepit. That's that because it? Bjorn Straussup's a 60-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's not 60 years old. I can't remember how, how old it is, but um, so Unix, you, C, C is a 60-year-old language. Um, so the... In C, in C Sharp, you also have out parameters, but they're a little bit nicer because you can tell that it's an out parameter from the syntax. You have to prefix it with out. In C++, it's really hard to see. Yep. You, have to, you can just pass any old variable in and it might be an out parameter. So there's all sorts of conventions around that. But the reason is because a line trace might fail, right? There's this Boolean return value, which you notice is a red pin. The red is always going to be a Boolean. And if it returns true, it hits something. If it returns false, it's hit nothing. So let's see if we can set up some kind of line trace. 
So what what would be a good start point for a line trace? I mean, at the moment, just the origin of the of the ship is fine. We can offset that, and we can see how to do that in Blueprint later. But just the, just the location so, of the ship. Let me show you. And we don't really care context. where on the ship right now. We don't. We can worry about the, that later. The center or something. And, and, you know, if you're really fussy, you'd be worried about where the guns are, and then you'd have some sort of thing you on could, the end of the gun. You could, for example, you could put a, a component in here, position it somewhere exactly in the viewport. In yeah. fact, let's do that, because that's going to be fairly simple. Then we might not have to ignore the ship. Cause yeah, because the problem with doing it just from the origin of the ship is if that's in the middle of the ship, it's going to collide with the ship. Then we've got to talk about filtering or whatever. So we let's call not it. talk about filtering and let's yeah. instead go and add a component. This shows you how this stuff works. I, I know that there is a component called an arrow component. So I'm going to stick this in. And you can see it's a nice visual component that shows us exactly what you'd expect an arrow, a little red arrow pointing in the direction along its x axis. And you notice that these components also have location. Unlike a Unity component, they actually have transforms. So this arrow is a child of the plane mesh. So wherever the plane mesh goes, the arrow will go also. Mary and had a little lamb. Exactly. And, and it followed it everywhere because it's a child of the transform. And so, yeah. Mary had a little bear to which she was very kind. And everywhere that Mary went, you could see her bear yeah, behind. Ah, ah, ah. Go away. Yeah. Okay. So we've got this arrow component. We're going to call, uh, let's rename it. So I'm actually not sure how you rename this on the Mac. Uh, so let's see. Rename F2. F2. Splodge F2. You can't get to F keys on a Mac uh, without a modifier. Nightmare. <laughs> anyway, right clicking is easy enough. So we're going to call this the, what's a good point? It's um, the, fire, the, um, the barrel it could just be the the barrel, the, yeah, the, the, the nozzle, the laser nozzle, the laser what, what is the what's origin? On, what's on the end of a laser origin? It could be. Uh, it could just firing be firing origin muzzle. That's the word muzzle muzzle muzzle. I don't know what a garlic a garlic. Let's just look up what a Dalek Dalek's muzzle is called. Yeah. Oh yeah, they must have a name. Come on, guys in the chat, you can help us out here. Okay, so we've got a muzzle, and the muzzle, as I said, has a transform. Therefore, it has a location in the world. And what I want to show you here is the context sensitivity in Unreal, which is really uh, with with Blueprint, which is really cool. I've got the muzzle component selected. I'm going to right click in the event graph, and I'm going to look for location. And just have a look. There's quite a few things in here, so maybe the context sensitivity is not super helpful. But oh yeah, right at the top here, we've got a section called call functions on muzzle utilities transform. So notice because I've got muzzle selected, it's giving me th functions to call on that muzzle component such as get world location. That's going to be what we want. So let's go ahead and get the world location. You see it's automatically added in two no nodes, one which gets that muzzle component, one that calls get world location on it. And here's something to explain a little bit, because in normal imperative programming, we have an order to all operations. So you've got the you do a print string, then you do get world, then you do line trace, or you do get world, then you do print string, then you do line trace. Here, with some of the nodes in Blueprint, you have no execution pin. You don't have this white pin. And that basically means that, yeah, there's no side effect. So it doesn't matter what order they happen in. So it will do it in whatever order it, it cares. Oh, it doesn't do matter it. what order it happens in, in this frame, I think is fair to say. I think it doesn't matter full stop. Well, the, the world location is going to change frame by frame, so it's got to matter. It's got to. It's got to. It's, the context got to be by frame, right? This thing gets run every frame. You can't just say world location because that value changes every frame. It's just yeah, but it has no side effect, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a really important point that these these, these nodes with no execution pins are pure functions in that frame. True. And they and that is really cool because it gives you. You can't mess things up now. So it's not changing go. state. And I can go ahead and connect up that return value. Okay. Nice. Now, how about the end? How are we going to calculate that? So, no, yeah, okay, don't mind. Yep, okay. So, the next thing, so for the end point, what we want to do is kind of look in the direction of this muzzle. So, go back to the viewport. The, the muzzle is pointing off into the distance. And we want to have some sort of range to our muzzle where, is there any way to annotate on the screen? You yeah, we can thing. annotate on the screen. Stand by. Oh, sorry, guys. I just, I just shouted in your ear, guys. I'm really sorry. It wasn't intentional. And I just, la, la, la. I've just stroked Sam's bare knee, which was worse. So, um, 
it's all going it's all going on here guys at going dev tv um yeah that wasn't intentional either so let's just let's just yes so what you do is you if you want to clear you clear if you want to start you start wow if you want to go to blue you go to blue deep and it doesn't work um so don't go to blue um and then yeah clear start basically and when you want to stop using this thing you have to hit escape and that thing will go red go back to black cool beans okay so start start oh, so click and start yeah try it again oh you bugger just <laughs> click in here start doesn't work one second oh i don't use this very often it's fabulous it's a great okay flawless. now it will work flawlessly F flawlessly it's not the best screen so what i'm thing. saying is that we want to project this off into the distance for some range and then <laughs> and then it doesn't stop drawing that's fantastic uh, that's like the world line okay and then this this mass over here is going to be our end location that's basically let's do. clear that that's uh this is working fabulously it technology is. eh right so let's let's try and figure out how we can do that we have got currently oh no oh escape escape yeah so clear. clear and then escape oh, yeah dear. you're good now okay i'm good to go right so let's go back people. to our I warn you guys it's stretch time in a few minutes we're not going to have you sitting on your bottoms for so long that your apple no. watch is ping at you Bing. So uh, we've got this world location. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the start location, add a certain amount of vector in the direction of our arrow, and that's going to create our end location. So we start off with the same start location, and then we want to add to it. So we can actually use this value in two places. Go ahead and add. And there's a few adds here. Let's do the one that is a vector plus a vector so we're adding a vector that is going to be that uh, that arrow i tried to draw that's going to be the end result of that is going to be our end location and we're going to have a direction plus the range so we want to have a range for our firing we don't want magic vari um, magic variables in our code even if it's blueprint so we're going to go ahead and add a variable in the my blueprint tab here it's got a plus to add a variable and it's going to be we can choose the type here in the details pane so i can go ahead and say this is going to be a float for distance and we're going to call it the range or what should we call it the laser range and let's just say in the tooltip we can even give this variable a tooltip that's quite cool in centimeters because that is the world units in unreal it's centimeters rather than meters don't know why probably historical reasons anyway so what we can do now is we want to get the direction of the muzzle yeah so muzzle is not local coordinates as you can see here in the get world location and also the line trace has to be done in world coordinates that's why keith that is your name so uh, we're going to do it in, well, in I, I find it easier to think in world coordinates, to be honest, rather than local coordinates, but we could add a big number to the X. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the forward direction of the muzzle. So let's pull off the muzzle and look for something like forward. There you go. Get forward vector, simple as. Uh, forward vector is going to be one unit. It's a unit vector, so it's going to be one unit. We can multiply that by the laser range. And that is going to give us a vector as long as the laser range. So let's go ahead and do that. Da, da, da. And then it's going to be add. Again, let's scroll up. This time we want to add, no, not add, multiply. I'm going to multiply by a float this time. And that's going to be what we're adding to our start vector in order to get our end vector and what's the float we're multiplying by not zero otherwise we'll end up in exactly the same location we're going to multiply by our laser range there you go so this is getting a little bit more complicated as it's getting more complicated i think it might make sense to extract some of this into its own function so let me show you how to do that just select the nodes you want to extract i think these ones are to do with firing so i'm going to right click and do a collapse to function boom collapsed and I'm going to just call it fire. There you go. It's a verb. I'm going to fire when the fire button is pressed. Funny that. Also scream exterminate just beforehand. 
So you can actually double click on an, any node that you have declared in here, any function, and it's going to go ahead and open up in a separate tab in this main area. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Okay, so fire is going to hit our line trace. And then what I want to do is I want to print out our hit result. So let's drag a node off the end of the line trace. So after the line trace, we're going to print to the screen, print a string to the screen. And let's see if there's a way of converting our hit value to text. Nope. I try and drag it across and you see that it says hit result structure is not compatible with string. So again, this is a strongly typed language and we can't just do conversions implicitly. Or if we try and do a conversion implicitly, we'll add in a node to allow us to do that. So what we need to do is actually break down this output pin. One way we can do that is right click on the output and see that there is a split struct pin because you can tell this is a struct because it is dark blue. And also if you hover over it, it says hit result structure. So if I right click on it and do a split result, split struct pin, then you get all of these lovely things which are the contents of that struct. Uh, including, let's see, anything useful. We can have the distance to the thing that we hit. We could have the actor that was hit. I think that's useful. Maybe we get the name of the actor that was hit. Let's see if that converts automatically to string. There you go. If I hover over the string input, you can see it says convert actor object reference to string. And if I put something in like that, it says that the way to convert it is to get the display name of the actor. So it automatically knows stuff like that, how to convert between or the most likely way that you might want to convert between an actor and a string because there could obviously be other ways too. Useful discovery yet again. Yeah, so this is the great thing about Blueprint. So we've got a line trace. I'm going to go and hit play, fly through our world and see whether oh, I've just thought of uh, an issue. We're getting exterminate, but I just thought of an issue is that actually the default laser range is going to be zero. So let's make some, that more sensible. I'm going to just make it not 10 meters, but uh, maybe 100, would we, 100 meters. In code, we would give this a default value. We'd initialize the variable to a default value that makes sense. Yep. What do we do in Blueprint? To, to, is, is that it? This, this, is, this, this is, is the, the initialization default. value. Yeah. So we okay. So we have to be aware of that. We're slightly more likely to make these type of errors in Blueprint then because we don't, we're not there in context. It's saying, also you know, a bit further down. I mean, usually I'd have my details pane over here and be a lot wider and, and a lot and deeper. And start thinking so about you, those. I would see that clear, clearly. I mean, here yeah. we've got a little bit of a screen real estate issue. So, and where are we seeing the default range inside the blueprint in graphically? Where is that? That is as an input what do you mean? to well the ra la laser range yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. So and if we click on that laser range, is there any? Does it? It's just going to show us that. Shows yeah. us that. And does that details panel of that laser range give us its initialization value in here somewhere? Yeah, down the bottom default value. Yeah, it's, okay. it's the same. It's the same details pane yeah. there. Okay, fine, cool. So go ahead and save it, and just show you that you don't actually need to compile it. Let's go ahead and hit play. Uh, let's go face towards something. There you go. I, I'm getting the template cube rounded showing up in the logs. Cool. So we're firing a virtual invisible carbon dioxide laser out into the out into the field and it's hitting something and we're interrogating the game object that we're hitting. Classic yep. line trace or ray cast as you might call it. Exactly. Probably a good commit point if we've got a, oh no we're not we're not we're not controlled. committing at the moment yeah. We'll do it later. Yep. Okay. Um Clayton, yes we will be adding another section to the uh, the 3D Unity course which will be Zombie Runner. Mhm. Mm so that's that. Cool. Cool. So uh what I want to do now is actually do something with that actor. So we've got the name of the actor. The logical thing to do when you're exterminating it is to destroy it. So boom, boom. So let's have a look. Could we make its visibility fade down rapidly? Could we make it increase the mesh increasingly transparent over a period of about half a second? So instead of just disappearing, it kind of goes zoop. Dis yep, we can do. We can if, try. If that's and simple. I mean, we can we refactor to that. Right? I don't know whether we can do visibility. Would be a material thing, so that would be quite complex. Would it? Okay. You'd have to have some kind of material that can Should be we translucent. Just encapsulate what we've already done so this blueprint doesn't get any bigger. So what... I have. You have. It's a fire function. Oh, okay. Well done. Yep. So, uh, it's so quick to do in, in yeah, blueprint. Yeah. In C++ You've already done that it. would take like half a minute. Anyway, so we've got this actor. We want to do something. We want to destroy it or delete. Let's just have a look. If I looked for delete, you can see it shows up with destroy. I, lo I love that feature of Blueprint. If you get the wrong word, it, it knows what to do. 
Uh, and you can see when I did that, it automatically connected up the execution pin because it knew that that was the logical place I might want to do it next. And obviously if it gets it wrong, you can disconnect the pin and do it again. Now we've got a lot of things that we're not using here on this line trace. So I just want to tidy this up a little bit by hitting right click. And I think we can, oh, we can, I think we should be able to hide things. Maybe if we right click on something we're not using. Hmm. Let me know if you know how to hide things there, because I thought there was a way of hiding the rest of the struct pins, but uh, maybe I'm just imagining a, I thought I saw a collapse there. Uh, there's this thing's a collapse. Yeah, but there was also, if you right click again, I thought I saw it. Is it a no? Right. I did the, uh, no. The straighten connection. No, okay. Maybe I'm getting, uh, maybe I'm wrong. So there's okay. no way to really clean that up too easily. Uh, so let's go ahead and play and see what happens now, whether we get a uh, manic destruction. There you go. We are deleting these things in the world by exterminating them. So that's quite fun. Com massive destruction. There you go. You're <laughs> wiping out the floor underneath things. This is quite fun. So if we wanted to change the parameters of that destruction, make something fade of fire a particle effect off, whatever, or probably better give some affordance to the actual laser travel. Can we fire out a particle? It's going to yeah. be hard because of the time now. It's going to be a completely different type of... Because you're line tracing in, in basically a single frame in an instant. Typically, lasers in games are not instantaneous. They tend to have a bit of a delay, mm. you know, a bit of a ridiculous bion. Yep. Um, so which of those two should we... And that's probably all we've got time for. Which of those two should we do? Should we make the block destroy with a bit more excitement or should we visualize the actual laser? Yeah, let us know. Let, let us know, know in, the, in the chat. We could also... I mean, another thing that we would add later on, maybe, is to make these blocks actually simulate physics, because I think at the moment they're set up as static, which is why the lighting's a bit funny. Oh, here's a good idea. Perceptual lucidity is saying an old school way of doing this would be to lerp the scale down to zero. We could do that. Can we lerp the scale oh, of yeah, the destination? So goes, yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Awesome. Thank you, Perceptual. Old school. You're we adding. like it. Yeah. Adding value. Oh, but by the way, Perceptual, it's, it's old school like that. S yeah. K, oh well. So I just had uh, uh, some errors in the log, so I wanted to see what those were. Fire from node. And that's saying none. But people are more keen on visualizing the laser, so we may have to wait till stream two to do to do both. Well, you will have to wait till stream two to do both I of those I think things. it's really fun to do the scaling thing because we can show them the blueprint graph stuff that you can't yeah, do very really easily easy in C++ and at yeah. all. Um, uh, well, can you do that in a function, though? I think you can't do it from a function. If we did a... Let's just go to the event graph. So, well, once you've got the destination do... actor, what can we do from it? Well, we can, we can set things on the scale, but what I'm thinking... Aha! Yeah, so I think it's only at the event graph level. Let me just double-check this. Yes. So if you're at the event graph and you right-click and scroll down to the bottom, there is this option to add a timeline. And a timeline is basically something that allows you to, if I double click it, animate a certain property over time. So I can do something like say, let's animate this float track and I want it to start off at one and then rapidly decline down to zero. So I can add in a, how do I add in a point? Right click, add key. I can give it a, at time zero, I want the value to be one. And then right click later on. And I can say that this value needs to be, let's we'll select that again. That the value needs to be zero after how long should it take to disappear? Is one half, second? Half a second. Half a second. So at the, at the most. that's probably a good amount of time. 0.5 and a value of zero. So that's going to be a scale down time. Uh, and if we go back to the event graph, what we see here is that there is a update pin and a finish pin. So after the timeline has finished animating, is there a way to use last keyframe? Try and say where, where it's finished. Oh, here it's the length, saying length of five, could do a length of two or something. 
Anyway, that's how long this will animate for. After two seconds, basically, it's going to go and call finish. And it's going to give us on every update this new track value. Let's rename the new track. That's a horrible, horrible name. How can I rename? Right click, rename. There you go. And we're going to call this the scale. Okay. So it looks like, sadly, our encapsulation is going to have to break a little bit because the fire is going to have to return the object. Because okay. we, can't, we can't move the timeline into there. But we'll just yep. to so show we, you the, we do a, there's some positives and negatives there, basically. Yeah, but at the top level game flow, it does elucidate the fact that this is, that firing has a nasty. It's doing more than one thing. It's 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 at the moment it's not really firing, is it? It's raycasting only to get something back. Yep. Um, so it could just be a naming issue. It could be that we hit the button, we print to the log. We don't even need to print to the log anymore, probably. Um, we just get the thing that we've hit, and then we do something else. So it might just be a question of renaming fire. We could do. Well, first of all, we want we want to get the actor out of here. Basically, I think that's the thing. Yeah. So it's just so just shoot laser input fire action ray ray cast or shoot yep. laser. So what's and this then blodge thingy. Is that naming no? guys naming and cache invalidation. You've got to love those. Does not work. No. Don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do to rename in on a Mac. So let's go and no. have a look. Function didn't if. didn't quite work. I did that. Function if two. Yeah. Yep. So let's rename it to uh, fire. What do we say? Um, just ray, ray cast, because that's all you're doing. Or line, I mean, that's... Boom. <laughs> okay. And what we want to get as a result out of this is the reference to that actor. So you can, selecting this function, go down to its outputs and add a new output. And we can select the type. We want uh, the object types. We want the object type actor. So it's going to be an actor reference. And this is going to, I'm just going to call this the victim, like so. Um, and then what you see here is you get a node out called victim. If I go into that function, somewhere here in purple, we've got this return node. This is a very visual language because it uses color to help you out. And it basically returns out this victim. So I'm going to remove the destroy for now and hook up the victim to be the hit actor and hook up the execution pin. So that basically means that out on the event graph, when the raycast is finished, the victim will be populated. So we're gonna go ahead and from there, play the timeline. And I believe, hmm, I think we can just hook our victim up to this timeline and call the update function on the victim. So let's do a scale set actor scale 3d there you go and we're going to hook up the scale from the timeline to our scale notice it's automatically converting it from a float to a vector probably by putting the float into each of the vector parameters if you hover over it, in fact it says convert float to vector where each element is that float and you can hook up the execution to the update pin so every time the timeline updates it's going to scale down to zero uh, we could deal with destroying it at the end, but let's just see whether this is working. This is the general idea of a timeline, is that it allows you to animate a certain property over time, which would be a lot harder to do in C++, because this is a kind of crazy execution flow going on here. Let's go ahead and hit play. And uh, let's point at an object. There you go, look at it animating down. Hmm but subsequent ones don't restart. So we need to figure out a way to restart this timeline. So play, rather than play, we need a play from start. There you go. Compile, save, and hit play. Avi from, uh, Avi from the Netherlands is saying, why don't you use the return value of the method to check if the raycast actually hit or not? I figure it would be more secure to avoid null references on the destroy method of the actor. Yep. I mean, I think, here's a null reference, I'm pointing at the world. Nothing terrible is happening. We could have a look in the logs, though. Let's have a look at the error message logs. Uh, access none trying to read property. So I think that's what's going on here. 
Thank you very much. Who was that saying that? Avi from Avi. Yeah. Avi from the Netherlands. Thank you very much for pointing that out. So what we can do is indeed we can add another out parameter, an out variable here. So in the outputs, we can go and add one, change the type to boolean, and say has victim. Constant problem with raycasting. It's always doing two things. Have you hit anything and what have you hit? So I mean, always... what we could do is just, just use the this. null reference, to be honest, because what if we're just saying, is has it got a victim? We can just say, if it's null, then don't that try to do That would make more sense. I'd rather see that than wrapping. So let's do valid. Is valid. This one is automatically a kind of execution flow thing. So I can execute the is valid check. And if it is valid, we play the timeline from start. We can also um, we can comment on that effectively. This is a good example of a why comment now in here. So this is the first time anything in this is not totally clear as to why we'd have added in is valid. Kind of is if you think about it, but how do we comment that, Sam? We just click there, right? Yeah. You, yeah, I think we can just, just click. zoom in a lot, I think, yeah, for the stream. Yeah, just the mouse scroll a little bit. Interesting. Okay, so in case. Or handle no, yeah, whatever, exactly. Cool, so that's that. Ta da. Yep. Thank you, Abby. Now, we've only got a few minutes because we've got a call shortly with uh, Udemy. Um, so we need to get in that's at half past so we're better I think this is a good start. place to, to it's probably a good place to stop what have we got we've got a ship flying around which they did for us we're line tracing or ray casting we shoot and look at that thank you Abby that's a really cool old school effect I really like that and was it Abby sorry it was perceptual lucidity who made that particular yep. comment so we might one thing I'm noticing is that we start doing the scale of zero these might not actually have started off with um, sorry we're starting with a scale of one and it looks like they didn't actually start with a scale of one so we might want to you know, take their original scale and multiply it by our timeline value rather than uh, what we're doing. But you get the, the idea. It's definitely doing some sort of... Ooh, access more than read properly. Well, we can sort that out in the next we one. We can right? sort that out in the next one. We're going to commit this after the stream, set up a Git repo and yep. such, and we can carry on from where we left, up, left yep. off. I think this is a good, good, end a good point. start. The Dalek simulator is uh, definitely exterminating things, left, right, and center. I'm pretty happy with that. That's cool. Cool. So a couple of things. If you want to learn uh, Unreal from scratch, but with C++, go and see us on Udemy there. Perceptual Lucidity is a series intended to focus on Blueprint. For the moment, we're going to focus on Blueprint because we don't do any of that in our Unity. Well, we do. We don't do so much in our Unity courses. Yep. And I think um, it's more accessible and visual for, more accessible for and Twitch visual. stream. And you're still coding. It's the and, same stuff. And it's quicker. We can get more done in a stream. Yeah. Without having to test things out. It's, you know, we can, we can explore the API. We can do more things kind of for, for the live moment. coding. Yeah, because what we want to get towards for Twitch strategy is that we can start to show people Fortnite-style mechanics so that um, Ninja and others come and raid our stream with twenty to 40,000 people at a time, um, showing the general population of the world how to make these type of games because this is the engine that makes Fortnite. So, yeah, for the moment, that's it. And also, we don't want you to sit and watch C++ compilation. You're quite right. That would be rubbish. It's still yeah. coding. It's still the same thing. It's still the same engine. There's not really any disadvantage just to... Yeah, we'd have to do a lot of way. waffling in between the C++ compilation, so that's no good. So we you need see, to prep for our, for in our, our, in our with courses. Microsoft. We pause those bit, those bits, so you don't have to. We do. don't have oh. to watch C plus plus We're not just going to leave them before we go. I think we better get them moving. Yep. So I need to just adjust some things on the computer, and then we're going to do a different type of uh, different type of warm up. Everyone join in. Yeah, everybody join in. We're going to so hard to see if we can make this work. Firstly, I need to swap the audio source of this thing across to my. You might want to escape this. There you go. And just in fact, I'll just kill Unreal in general, so yep. we don't change its state. Let's go to that. So, testing one, two, three. Yep, I think you can hear me. The sound quality will change slightly. I'm now going to spin this round to the outside. And then we're going to do a bit of an exercise, but I'm going to cheat. But it's going to be fun. So let's just spin this round. Then I've got to change the exposure. Lots, lots. Actually, not so lots. It might, it might work itself out now. It's not quite going to work itself out. Okay, so let's just mess around with the exposure for a second. And then you guys need to get up on your feet because we are going to be bouncing in a second. Yeah. It's going to be the key here. Let's go down a whole EV. EV, that's the rendering engine in Blender. Oh, wow, we need the new rendering engine in the new Blender 2.8 to go down even further. I can't actually open that left-hand door. It's kind of, it's gunk closed, I think is the word. Um, you know what so the problem is? Focus. No, it's not. Well, maybe, yeah, we could do that in a... Sick. 
the, the, the problem line, the reason I couldn't do the, e the uh, equalization, the, the exposure, is just because the shutter speed was too low and it couldn't actually turn the ISO down that low. Well, that low. looks good. I think we can see outside. That'll do. Okay, so we're going to do some bouncing. So we'll start off without cheating. I don't. On the microphone, is that yeah, they should be able to hear me. Confirm you can hear me. I'm sure you can. So one thing we can do is just bounce just without any, um, without any anything. This is a really easy kind of wake yourself up. Feels really good. Just bounce. Don't let your heels touch the ground. Let your hands flop around if you like. And we can just bounce around a bit. And that will warm us up and get us going. Now, then we're going to cheat because something arrived in the post today. I'm just going to check the chat and make sure you can actually hear you. You can hear us. Cool. So for this piece of cheating, I need a, um, a helmet. Now... <laughs> No, Sam's much more sensible than I am. Oh, I'm also going to need some footwear, although it's only going to be flip-flops. Um, I have just purchased... Make it safer. What's that? A pair of flip-flops really make it any safer. No, it makes it slightly more bearable. <laughs> so I've only tried this once. This could go wrong live on TV. So Vertigo Pro Medium Pogo Stick. Yes, it's nearly as big as I am, which is kind of crazy. So you saw it here first. Always wear a helmet. Always wear um, steel-tapped appropriate footwear. Um, I'll go far enough that they can see it. What could possibly go wrong? Wow! That's crazy! I'll be doing somersaults on this soon. Whoa, no, don't try this at home! Uh, so if you haven't got one of these and you need to take a break, then just bounce up and down yeah. on the spot. But you don't necessarily have vertigo. to get quite as out of breath as Ben. But no, that's uh, surprisingly exhausting. Yep. Guys, it's good to do some silly stuff at the end of the streams with you guys. Yep. Thank you for being here. Oh, Sam's so spinning the camera around. It's all a little bit too neat, my desk. <sighs> so there you go. If you want to see more silly stuff, go to my Twitch channel. I'm not streaming on there yet, but I might do one day Ben Tristan. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you, um, guys. And I'll, in a panting way, say goodbye. <laughs> it's goodbye from me. Yep, and it's goodbye from him. <laughs> That's what they say. The two Ronnies, anyway. The two Ronnies, yeah. All right, guys. See you soon. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you for everything.